First of all, uh, policy-based uh, reform of economy, uh, we have to say that reforms are an inevitable uh, prerequisite for growth in uh, competitiveness and uh, competitiveness is a necessary prerequisite for economic growth and this in turn is a prerequisite for better standard of living and higher wages. Uh, reforms through uh, competitiveness and economic growth are an essential instrument for improving quality of life. And one of the most important problems is that reforms are much less of a technical problem than a political problem. Uh, I like to say that reforms are 90 to 95 percent. Uh, reforms are not a technical problem, they are rather a political problem. When we talked about the post-communist transformation, which we were a part of, uh, 26 years ago when communism fell, it was also a technical problem. We, it was not clear how to uh, successfully transform a central planned economy. It was only the only thing we knew is that uh, it was going to be difficult. Adam Michnik, one of the leaders of the Solidarity Movement in Poland, he said that we know how to change uh, aquarium into a fish soup, but we don't know how to change fish soup fish fish soup into an aquarium, uh, meaning that it is easy to uh, nationalize uh, uh, private uh, nationalize uh, private entities but it is difficult to privatize and make them uh, uh, state property make them uh, private uh, what is now known and this is not only proved by by post communist transformation and also from countries such as Denmark also countries such as Sweden and also many other countries we have learned to know that a key prerequisite for increasing uh, competitiveness is economic freedom. At the same time, it is very important that economical policy focused on economic freedom is an inevitable prerequisite of higher economic growth and uh, convergence and catching up, but also it is much more difficult because uh, what comes into play is perseverance. Uh, it is not just about the economical politics that is done by the government, but also accumulated wealth, not just political and uh, economical, but also know-how and effective management and education and science, because this perseverance is great and one of the best evidence is that uh, when we take a look at the chart of uh, the wealthiest countries now and 100 years ago, you see the same countries. Uh, it is very exceptional that a country that used to be poor manages to make it into uh, the richest countries. And it is even more exceptional that uh, if one of the countries that used to be very rich uh, drops out of the list. And there are some famous examples, for example, Asian tiger countries such as Singapore, Taiwan and Hong Kong, but also Ireland. And additionally, what is even more um, uh, exceptional is countries that were there and are not. And maybe the worst example is Argentina, which about 100 years ago used to belong to top 10 of the wealthiest, most developed countries economically. And now they are somewhere on the position of 70 to 80. Uh, little is known is that Czechoslovakia in the first uh, Czechoslovak Republic was at around 15th or 16th position. As uh, even in 1948, Czechoslovakia had higher GDP per capita than Austria. After 40 years of communism, we dropped down to 50%. Czechoslovakia was in about half of the uh, level of Austria. And now, 25 years later, after all this transfor transformation, we still did not catch up with Austria. We are still at around 75% of, of um, the Austrian level. And all this is yet another proof that uh, economical freedom, but also political freedom, although it is a bit more complicated in this regard, is a key prerequisite of competitiveness, growth, and also, in other words, if a country 
wants to overcome this perseverance and become wealthy and is not wealthy now, the only chance for them to do is to do radical reforms built on the principle of economic freedom. What economic freedom is, I don't have to explain that now because all the previous speakers uh, talked about that. Uh, uh, it is not about the size of the state, it is not about taxation, it is about the freedom of business uh, and trade, effective regulation, it is about uh, enforceability of law, struggle against corruption, protection of uh, property rights, etc. Another proof that, uh, well, let's just come back to the political freedom, because it is a bit more complicated, but still in principle, although there are some exceptions like Singapore, in principle it is true that uh, even political freedom is a prerequisite of competitiveness and growth. When transformation, post-communist transformation started 26 years ago, it was maybe not that clear, but now when we take a look at this experience, we see that post-communist countries that did not just reforms based on economic freedom, but also had a plurality, plurality uh, political system, that means they had political freedom, where governments used to change quite a lot. Those countries were also more successful economically than countries that had semi-authoritarian or uh, governments or dictatorships, such as some countries uh, of the former Soviet Union. And another very interesting experience, even from our post-communist trans transformation, is that countries, because well, this conference, the thesis I mentioned, those uh, post-communist countries that uh, based their reform process on increasing the amount of uh, economic freedom, they made reforms were focused on liberalization, deregulations, and um, improving uh, polit uh, economical um, situation. Uh, those countries were much more successful. There are five countries that uh, are, in my opinion, the most successful. Three Baltic countries, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, then Poland and Slovakia. And these countries are quite clear, and I think that we can agree that uh, success could be measured by the convergence progress, that means how fast are these countries managing to catch up with countries of Western Europe in their economical level. For example, in 2000 to 2012, in these five countries, the mean rate of convergence progress was 21.4%. Uh, on average, each of those uh, caught up with the level of the EU15 countries um, by more than 20 and in percent. In Hungary, it was about 7%, in Slovenia, 3%. It's evident that Hungary and Slovenia they did economic policy that was not focused on increasing the level of political f of economical freedom and on liberal reforms. And I wanted to talk about something else, but I have to mention Sweden because this illustrates what the previous speaker talked about Denmark. Because in Sweden, Sweden is often used as an example, as an evidence that socialism does work and that economic freedom is not as important. But it is not true. Because Sweden became rich thanks to liberal economic reforms that were uh, put in force at the end of 19th century in 1880, uh, around the year 1880. In, in 1890, Sweden had only 60% of the level of uh, what could be compared to uh, Western European countries, the group of eight countries of uh, uh, the richest countries of Western Europe. Uh, mean GDP of those eight countries in Western Europe was uh, only, Sweden had only 60% of those countries. In 1950, Sweden reached 140% of the GDP of this group of countries. And the mean annual growth in uh, 1890 until 1950 was 5.6% per year and in uh, other countries it was only 1.4 percent 
the reason was a liberal economic system based on economic freedom because in, in the 50s Sweden had lower taxation than the United States of America. Then what happened was the period of socialism and increasing taxes and increasing regulation and in the years 1950 and 19 90, Sweden had lower economic growth than those Western European countries and the reforms uh, at the, uh, in the 90s also started further economic growth in Sweden. But I have two minutes left, so uh, let me just draw to the conclusion, which is politics and political economy and reform politics. Why those reforms? Because it would seem that such reforms they bring economic growth economic growth brings higher standard of living uh, so politicians should be motivated to do such reforms because politicians want people to live better but the principal problem uh, is in time inconsistency and in the risk of doing reforms the risk is connected with the fact that as we saw an image of Denmark uh, how the Prime Minister was uh, giving a speech. We also had similar civil uh, situation, similar situation in Slovakia. People did not trust the government. There were strikes because reforms everywhere in the world are unpopular, and it is normal and it is natural. People do not like changes. And those who say that well, there are some reforms that could be popular, they're wrong. I don't think so because even reforms that rationally are uh, positive, they uh, lead to doubts because human psyche has uh, risk aver aversion imprinted as a part of its DNA. That means to do reforms means risk, means conflict, political risk, political conflict, and this is the main reason why this is difficult because reforms require, require political leadership, and this is the most important prerequisite, and this is something that we miss and not only in the countries as the Central and Eastern Europe, but also the Western Europe. And the missing uh, prerequisite for reforms is political leadership. That means the will, the courage and the vision to do reforms and to do them, although they are difficult. And please let me con conclude by three of my uh, favorite quotes that uh, put this topic into uh, perspective. First one is by Thomas Sodel, an American writer who said, the first rule of economy is scarcity. We never have enough resources to satisfy the needs of everybody. The first rule of politics is not respecting the first rule of economy. And this is something that illustrates uh, the conflict. The second uh, is by Benjamin Disraeli who said what is the difference between a politician and a statement whereas the politician thinks about the future elections, a statesman thinks about future generation. And this illustrates uh, the importance of the long-term view and not succumbing to the political cycle and trying to be popular by giving stuff away, but uh, focusing on changes that will bring benefits maybe beyond the nearest horizon. And the latest uh, quote is by a living legend, Jean-Claude Juncker, who uh, in an, uh, several years ago when I was a Minister of Finance taking part in a coffin, why it is not possible to, to implement the Lisbon strategy, which meant that until 2010 Europe was supposed to catch up with the United States and have higher competitiveness. And we were uh, again and again discussing about the four reforms we have to do. Then Jean-Claude, the then uh, Prime Minister and Minister of Finance of Luxembourg said, well, yes, we all know what we have to do but we don't know how to get re-elected doing that. So I think that from this we can see that political leadership is what is important, important and what is uh, missing, uh, not only in connection with political reforms, but also in connection with crises such as the migration crisis and further crises we are facing. Thank you very much.